What if I told you everything you've learned in school and church is a total lie? Would that surprise you? Well, it continues to surprise me as I continue to do research in my own family background and the church I was born into, which is the Mormon Brighamite Utah Church. So I found this collection of essays online dealing with the latter months of Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith's life in Nauvoo. Most interesting are the essays done by pretty famous people, Charles Adams and Josiah Quincy, both who traveled to Nauvoo to find out the political position of the Mormon prophet they knew as Joseph Smith. And what I discovered is might surprise you. Essays reveal is one, Joseph Smith did not live full time at the mansion house, was on constant move to evade arrest. Smith greets his visitors at the door in very dirty, disheveled traveling clothes. It appears that he has just arrived just before the gentleman. This is further apparent when Smith has no idea which room is empty of sleeping Mormons sharing beds. He shows the men to two or three rooms, finally settling on one room in which there is only one sleeping Mormon, throws a coat over the Mormon's head, tells him to not be disturbed, and he pulls up the chair for his two visitors and they sit down to discuss politics. This is a very amusing scene and one in which the irony is just immeasurable. Later, he shows the men into the breakfast room in which there are 30 Mormons sitting around a table eating. Smith disappears for a while and then returns clean-shaven and in clean clothes. His visitors report he is in all black. Later, Adams finds a letter from Smith's Chicago attorney telling him that there are many people trying to destroy him, that he must keep low and keep in hiding and keep moving. This is apparently what Smith has done for almost the full four years that he was in Nauvoo. Again, emphasizing the fact, as one woman did to me in Nauvoo, Smith hardly had time to marry 30 wives when he was in hiding for four years. Coming back to Nauvoo only on business and under heavy guard. 2. Smith appears unaware that there is a book of Abraham as late as May 15, 1844. This is demonstrated when he shows Adams and Quincy his mother's mummy in her bedroom. While Smith is demonstrating the scrolls and the hieroglyphics meanings, he turns to Lucy for guidance in their translation. By this, Adams deduces that it is his mother's mummies and the hieroglyphic and scrolls are her possessions. This is further demonstrated when the gentlemen are escorted from Lucy Mack's chamber. Smith jokingly advises them that his mother usually collects 25 cents for the viewing of these antiquities, to which the gentlemen graciously comply, paying Lucy Smith the 25 cent viewing fee. Three. Smith appears completely unaware of the concept of baptism for the dead because during a religious demonstration to these gentlemen in a debate with a Methodist preacher, Smith emphatically states that it is in paradise where people are given the opportunity to be baptized. He fails to state that there is any requirement that the baptism actually take place on earth by proxy, which is done in Mormon temples today. Four, Smith appears completely unaware that he had been a month or two previous announced his running for the president of the United States because he states emphatically to Adams and Quincy that he is voting for Henry Clay and this is as late as May 1844. These astute political interviewers who were sent to interview Smith to see where his political affiliation lay would have certainly stated that Smith was an active candidate for president rather than trying to find out who he was going to vote for and influence the Mormon blo voting bloc. Five, Smith states clearly he is against slavery and it was this 
vigilantes and Governor Boggs who ran the Mormons out of Missouri based on the slavery issue. He states, however, that he does not advocate violence to overthrow the slave laws, but clearly states his position, which Adams later notes as being very prescient and wise. Smith indicates to them that he is in favor of a plan to have the, to have the U.S. sale certain tracts of land in order to raise the funds necessary to pay slaveholders for releasing their slaves. This had been done in Britain very successfully and they abolished their slave laws without violence. This is contrary to the bloodbath that was about to occur during the Civil War. Contrary to thus saith the Lord like prophecies, Smith indicates that he received inspiration from the Lord when there are burning religious questions that needed to be answered for his Mormon movement. However, Smith clearly states to the men that he does not turn to prophecy or an any inspiration from the Lord about who to vote for or in any matters of politics. This is contrary to how Mormons are taught in Sunday school, which characterizes Joseph Smith as a prophet in the mold of John the Baptist who wandered the desert in sackcloth and ashes and <laughs> ate locusts. Anyway, at all times, in these essays, Smith's humor is evident. When asked to prophesy as to whether Tyler will win the presidential nomination, Smith says that as a prophet, he can prophesy as to what is probable and to what is possible. And Smith states, it is neither probable or possible that Tyler will win. Adams remarks later on that this prophecy was indeed accurate. Another playful interaction which is mischaracterized by the negative nabobs of Mormon scholars, is his response to Adams when asked how Smith can avoid corruption when he holds so much power, such as being the mayor, the general of the militia, and a prophet to a vast Mormon movement. Smith winks and states that, indeed, such power would corrupt the ordinary man. But by the way, he is not or ordinary. He is a prophet, you know. And I just find this interaction just very endearing. And then finally, it is very clear from these essays that Smith ties the Mormon exile from Missouri and their persecution to the fact that the Mormons were abolitionists and against slavery. Smith states that Missouri is a pro-slavery state and he believes that the Missouri Compromise was a mistake, that there should be no more states admitted into the Union, that became slave states, that the only way that slavery could finally be abolished is through an orderly abolition plan of buying the slaves from present slaveholders for a fair price and releasing them. This was done in Britain and many landholders with slaves became massively wealthy on this program of an orderly abolition of slavery through peaceful means. Secondly, Smith is indicating that the Missouri Compromise in which they divided the north of Missouri into anti-slavery and the south into a slaveholding state to be a mistake. This is absolutely contrary to what Brigham Young eventually did in Utah, in which they settled the Salt Lake Valley and the Utah Basin and immediately made it a slave state. So with this, you can see that Joseph Smith's church indeed was a totally separate, identifiable, and different religion than the one imposed by Brigham Young through terror on the Utah saints. <laughs>